at Dead shows, widespread panic shows, Unfreeze McGee shows. Um, if there's a jam band show on the East Coast, you probably saw me there. I probably sold your children acid. <laughs> the age of uh, 24 um, there were other drugs like uh, cocaine you know around with the deadheads very accessible it was never my thing you could put a whole plate up to me and I'd be like yeah no thank you or I'd do a line and not have to do it again but ketamine I would do a line find the guy that was selling it buy all of it really <laughs> and I would go into my hotel room or to my apartment by myself whoever wanted to do ketamine with me and we would just sit on ourselves and drool, sit sit by ourselves and drool and ketamine uh does what to you uh the first time i remember it very vividly um it's like a 15 minute acid trip real fast but you're also wonky it's a disassociative so you're not your body's really not connected to your brain um there's some type of euphoria in that for me. I don't know what it is. My brain thinks fast, so mm -hmm. <laughs> to have a break from it's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really is. Uh, so uh, let's, let's, let's start with the beginning. Where, where are you from originally? Okay, I'm from um, Anne Arundel County, Maryland, Crofton, Maryland. Uh, grew up there till I was about uh, 15, 16 years old. And then I moved in with my aunt. Uh, my parents were uh, well-to-do people, um, both LDS Mormon. Really? Uh, yeah. My mom came to the church um, when she was a teenager. And my dad grew up in the church, went on a mission, came back from his mission, met my mom in church. And I was born not too long after. And they were married not too long after. We grew up with a brother, two sisters, and uh, pretty good upbringing, um, except for just lots of rules with the church. Um, I was rebelling from a young age, third, I would say 12 on. My grandmother had died. She was like the glue of our family. And then my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, throughout my teenage years, just knowing your mom's dying, it's just really weird it's gotta be horrible and you're also questioning your faith you know so like why god you know because we i was very strong in my faith um at a young age and uh yeah, that just crippled it you lost your mom eventually um she passed away when i was 26. so she fought it a long time she fought it for um yeah long time say 15 almost 20 years in between there breast um, cancer breast cancer. It had spread, I believe it spread to her back and brain in the end or something like that. How do you think that losing your mom or, or seeing your mom fight cancer for so long um, played, played, you know, played a role in your life? It made me want to be more free and live. Um, also growing up Mormon, like I, you know, developed my own brain, you know, I, didn't believe in this. And you tell you, if I would have told my dad that, I've got the crap beat out of me. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, eventually you did, I did start to tell him that. I'm like, I don't believe in this, you know? And it was go to church every Sunday, no matter what. And you, under my house, you, under my roof, you do this and that. And it was, it sucked. What do you think of organized religion being forced on kids? Um, I, I don't like that at all. Like, I, I definitely grew up in a cult. You can't tell me other eyes. You cannot tell me otherwise. Um, but yeah, just wanting to be free, that's what led me to, you know, mostly everything after that. Which was what, you, you, you toured with the dead? Yeah. Grateful um, Dead? At the age of 16, I moved in with my Aunt Kathy, and uh, my Aunt Kathy was a lot more lenient. She had a rule that if you want to smoke pot, do it in the house. If you want to drink beer, do it in the house. 
Uh, and no, nobody else can come over. It's just you and me. Whatever. I'll chill with you. But that's no fun. <laughs> and uh, of course, I had to go outside the house. I'd disappear for days. You know, I'm a high school student, disappearing for days, getting drunk and smoking weed, coming back three days later. Went to school every day, but didn't come home. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it was just, I don't know. I never liked going home. <laughs> and, you, and your personality is drastically different than your siblings. Definitely. Um, and you were raised the same way, so it's just raised your, the your, same your DNA way must be. I just had different ideas. Yeah. From, uh, I guess I spoke up from a young age. For, if I didn't think it was right, I spoke up. <laughs> you think for yourself? You, you, you think for yourself? Yeah, I think for myself. I think that's important. Um, yeah, at the age of 16, moved in with my aunt. Um, I met a girl at school. Her name was Kristen. She was a little hippie girl. At the time, I really liked heavy metal, Slipknot, all that stuff. Uh, misfits, you know, just whatever I could be to be dark and evil. And uh, I was wearing black until they made something darker. Um, <laughs> I uh, went to a Grateful Dead concert with her or followed her to a Grateful Dead concert at Meriwether Post Pavilion. And I was the only one with money. She said, hey, come here. And we went to some kids in the parking lot. And these kids, I guess, had LSD. I gave them 20 bucks. They gave us three hits. I had never done drugs except for marijuana, maybe a few beers in my life at a time. Like, it never really went crazy. Um, so I, I just remember being like, oh, I'm not doing that. Like, you, you can do whatever you want, you know? And she's like, do you trust me? I was like, yeah, I trust you. What do you mean? Next thing you know, they just hit a acid on my tongue, and I'm watching The Grateful Dead. So, uh, after that, everything changed. <laughs> um, I was exposed to that. Um, remember, I remember when we got out of the concert, there's a dude holding a sign saying, get me to the next concert. And I'm like, what's that? What's he talking about? And they go, oh, they're going to the next concert, the next town tomorrow night. I'm like, they do this every night? Like, yeah, and they do a different set list every night. It's never the same. And I'm like, oh, whoa, this is kind of cool. So got exposed to that. Um, I dropped out, went to Job Corps, got my GED. Uh, during the weekends at Job Corps, if the dead was in with 100 miles during the weekend, I was there. Uh, other jam bands, Widespread Panic, Fish, uh, Mo, it was, if they were within that area, I was going. Um, by the age of 21, 22, uh, college was not going to be a thing for me. I realized that fast. Neither was a regular job. <laughs> um, I go into shows during the years. I had met a few people that I knew I could uh, make money with. And uh, yeah, I started going town to town, concert to concert, hotel to hotel making money any way I could. And a lot of that money was through LSD. S selling LSD? Selling LSD, yeah. yeah. At dead shows? At dead shows. <laughs> uh, at dead shows, widespread panic shows, Umphreys McGee shows. Um, if there's a jam band show on the East Coast, you probably saw me there. And I probably sold your children acid. <laughs> You're the black sheep of the family? Black sheep of the family, definitely. Um, I don't believe they practice Mormonism anymore, but there's instilled morals from that religion that they keep, and I just, I don't mesh with it. What are, what are the ones that you bump up against oh, the hardest? Well, um, Drug-free. Drug <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I've, I've been in and out of addiction, uh, but uh, never brought it around them. But uh, yeah, Mormons have a strict drug-free policy, even when it comes down to caffeine. That's one of the things that stuck around. Um, you know, um, I think they, my dad come to, has come to accept that pot does help me. 
<laughs> but everything else, you know, you can throw in the trash bag. You, you've tried other drugs as well? Oh, yeah. I have definitely tried other drugs. Um, I've uh, definitely uh, tried LSD, MDMA, MDA, ketamine, PCP, uh, methamphetamine, uh, amphetamines, Adderall. I mean, I, I think I've done it pretty much a good amount. What, what is the attraction? Um, my, the drugs that I liked were the ones you couldn't overdose on. I remember the first time someone telling me you can't, uh, you can't overdose on LSD. And I just puddle myself. I'd sit there and puddle myself. Um, I was definitely a space cadet, a psycho not. <laughs> um, I would, there was a time where I was a good point, good three years where I took acid every day, doubled up. Really? There were little breaks in between, but at least, I mean, every week I was on LSD, MDMA, MDA. So you, you did LSD pretty much every day for a period of? Yeah, a period of, I would say, two years. And, and so you seem perfectly coherent and... Sometimes. Un, 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 <laughs> you, don't, you don't seem affected. You know, you'd think, oh my God, you'd have lots of brain damage. There's, there's days, you know, where um, um, stuff happens, trippy stuff. It's not like a big flashback, you know, but, uh, you know, something twinkles or something starts to wave, melt, and I just shake my head, look, and go, that was trippy, and that's about it. So you, you know? think there is some kind of residual effect from doing that much acid? Definitely. There's, in the high amounts I was doing, uh, definitely. There, I mean, I've, I've done thumbprints. So if you know what a thumbprint is. I don't. A thumbprint is when they take the crystal LSD basically uh you know crystal uh, lsd when you get it on paper is measured in micrograms um the way you get it on crystal it's you got to be high up there and i've seen grams before grams of lsd that's about ten thousand hits i believe that one gram is about yeah 10 pages which is about ten thousand hits of lsd and it's a uh for some people, a thumbprint is a uh, um, almost an initiation. Um, but uh, you lick your thumb and you put it on the crystal, and it's instant. There's there's no turning back. Like you're in for a wild ride. I'm not talking. Oh, uh, you're going to be up for all night on LSD. You're going to be up for a good two weeks, month on LSD. Mm, really? So have fun. Uh, thumbprints are usually for people who have a tolerance. It's not recommended to do if you uh, ha are, not are on a fresh, if you're not uh, not experienced, if you're on a fresh head. No, uh, thumbprints I would say are more for people who who have been eating acid every day, like me, <laughs> and want to trip. Why did you stop? Um, I stopped doing LSD because I stopped selling it. Um, I saw it was affecting my life. Uh, it came a point in my life where, you know, I'm at festivals and I'm selling drugs to 18 year olds and I'm fucking 30 years old. Like, what am I doing with myself, you know? Oh, so you were selling it? As I'm selling it, you know? Yeah. So around the age of 30, I, I started to think I need to start to get my ass straight. And eventually you discovered ketamine? Um, ketamine came around age, uh, I would say 25, oh, okay. 26. Same, same time. Yeah. And, uh, that, that had something to do with me leaving that scene. And, uh, I, that, that's the one drug that grabbed me by the balls. LSD, that was a hoot. That was fun. I can't honestly tell you a bad time on LSD. That's just my experience. But ketamine, ketamine grabbed me by Ketamine got me. And what, what, <laughs> what are the downsides of doing? If you're addicted to ketamine? No, not not at all. I haven't done ketamine in about. I dabbled in in it about a year ago, and I did a gram, like you know, fucked up, you know, regretted it, didn't really like it. But before that, I hadn't really done it for about three or four years. Um, at the end of my ketamine addiction, uh, I was doing an ounce a day, 
$800 day habit. Mm. And it, I wasn't buying any of it. I was living with my ketamine dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I would, and he was my friend, one of my best friends. I would go upstairs to his room, smoke a joint, and there was a, a pillow sack, like a, you know, a, a sack of ketamine on the floor, like a pillowcase. And you just, I would put my hand in, take a scoop, go downstairs and play PlayStation all day and wait for people to call me for drugs. It's a long, it's a long way from um, a Mormon upbringing. Yeah, that is, it really is. Um, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> long way. And how old are you now? I'm 35. Now. 35. And you're working now? Yeah. Um, I was just uh, had a gig here uh, doing truck washing for a while. I was making good money doing that, but uh, that came to an end. So I applied at Amazon, working with Amazon before. Mm -hmm. So your so, life is stabilized a bit? A little bit stabilized. I'm in and out of hostels. I still like to stay nomadic. Some nights I stay in a tent. Um, I don't stay on the street here. I have a hiding spot. Don't like to be in public view and, you know. This is, this is a dangerous neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Good not staying here. <laughs> I, I wonder why people come here to stay because, um, I mean, I know, I know there are drugs here, but aside from that, get your drugs and get out. I mean, I came here when I first came here. Skid Row? Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe because I grew up a street kid and it's just the first thing you know to go to when you come to L.A. when there's nowhere to go. And you mentioned earlier that you've been to Kensington. Yeah, I've lived in Kensington. I've been to Kensington. Kensington, uh, uh, I kind of prefer this place over Kensington. I don't know what it is, but Kensington. The weather's nicer. Yeah, the weather's nice here. Maybe that's it. <laughs> they both have to be rough lifestyles. Yeah, they're very rough places. And so your future, do you think, I mean, you have no kids? Not that I know of, no. <laughs> And you think, You'll ever dabble with any of these? Uh, is ketamine a, a hallucinogenic? Uh, it's a hallucinogenic at first. I remember my first, I remember, I mean, meant to tell you, like the first trip, the first time I did it, that 15 minute trip, you're chasing that. And I never got it again. I just got the disassociative bumbling around, drunk kind of. I mean, if you saw someone on ketamine, you'd think they were drunk. Yeah. Pretty much. Do you think there's ever a chance that you get experimenting with these things again? Um, there's always that, there's always, you know, you can't say no, you know, you can't say. Uh, yeah, it seems to be in your, it's in your it's, personality to do it. Yeah, but uh, I've stayed away. Uh, as soon as I hear about it, I don't like to be near it. Um, I remember where it took me. Um, yeah. I remember having a lot of money and like after ketamine, I had no money. Like it's, I had no friends either. That's kind of the case with all these drugs. Yeah. Um, well, they find you, a way to unravel your life. Yeah. Well, even with, even with selling them, dude, um, I had so many friends when I was selling drugs, so many. And there's about a handful around of those people now and they know who they are. What would you say is the most important thing you've learned? in all of this, in your 35 years? Listen to your parents. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, if they have before. a good, if they're good parents. Yeah. <laughs> they only mean the best for you. I know people have different upbringings. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, education and uh, don't, don't work for anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> but yourself. Do you have any regrets? Uh, yeah. Um, just wish I had my family. That's about it. Wish I could understand where I come from, but yeah, don't expect them to. Yeah, it's hard when, the, when those when those connections fall apart. They become difficult to to mend sometimes. Yeah. Especially when you're as different as you are from your family. Yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a bad upbringing, but it wasn't a good upbringing. Um, 
I mean, you have these laws from the church and these rules from the church that I couldn't be a kid. I couldn't be a teenager. Um, I wasn't even doing drugs. I was sneaking out to the bowling alley to be with my friends and getting in trouble for it because it was too late out, stuff like that. Just simple things. Really, what I think it came down to is the church got in the way of the way my parents parented. Like, you, you shouldn't have anyone else raise your kids. That's about it. <laughs> All right. Philip, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yep. I wish you the best of luck with whatever you do from here. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. <laughs>